Hello everyone, today we'll be talking about metabolic calculosis and we'll understand the physiological principles behind it. And in the next couple of lectures, we'll figure out how to diagnose and how to manage it. So metabolic alkalosis is either gain of a bicarb or loss of a chloride. And whenever your body gains a bicarb, it loses a chloride and vice versa. So you can already see why your metabolic alkalosis is always hypochloremic. The other thing to remember is loss of chloride ion is equivalent to loss of a proton. Both achieve the same results, that is metabolic alkalosis. And in the human body, the chloride and proton loss are almost always linked. So loss of one leads to loss of other. In Stewart approach to acid base, chloride is a strong ion, therefore it's a very strong acid. So whenever you lose chloride, you become more alkalotic. This also makes sense because of law of electron neutrality. If you lose a chloride, you have to lose a positive ion, that is your hydrogen ion. So think about hydrogen and chloride as two sides of a coin. The most important fact to remember in metabolic alkalosis is that there is difference in renal handling of electrolytes due to different amount of electrolytes reaching the collecting duct. And this is different when the production of aldosterone is primary versus when aldosterone is stimulated by hypovolemia. So we'll go through five basic principles of metabolic alkalosis. Pause the video if you need time or read the reference in the description below. Understanding volume status in metabolic alkalosis is of prime importance. With volume depletion, you stimulate your renin angiotensin system, resulting in production of angiotensin 2 and aldosterone. Angiotensin 2 stimulates proton secretion in the proximal convoluted tubule in exchange for sodium ion, and aldosterone works in the collecting duct with excretion of hydrogen ion and exchange of sodium and potassium. So aldosterone secretion causes bicarbonate absorption, acid loss and potassium loss. As you understood before, aldosterone stimulates your sodium and potassium channels. It also stimulates your sodium potassium ATPs. So it results in loss of potassium and absorption of sodium and this results in water absorption as well. Potassium loss leads to hypokalemia. Aldosterone also stimulates hydrogen ATPs. So release of hydrogen ion in the urine and generation of bicarbonate ion. So aldosterone excess results in improving blood pressure volume expansion, alkalosis, and hypokalemia. In primary hyperaldosteronism, there is excess aldosterone resulting in volume expansion as the primary reason. This results in large amount of sodium and chloride reaching the collecting duct. Some of the sodium is absorbed through the aldosterone pathway while a lot of sodium is still excreted out. So your urine is rich in sodium, potassium, and chloride. Your Fe urea is more than 35% and your urine pH is low. Sodium absorption results in negative interluminal charge, therefore results in better excretion of hydrogen and potassium ion. So increased sodium absorption from aldosterone results in more efficient proton and potassium excretion. So it again helps worsen metabolic alkalosis. Hypokalemia is very important in metabolic alkalosis. As we learned in your metabolic acidosis lesson that Hypokalemia is a strong stimulator for ammonia production and it results in bicarb generation. In collecting duct and distal convoluted tubule, it stimulates your hydrogen potassium exchange and results in intracellular acidosis. Intracellular acidosis results in better bicarb absorption. It also stimulates hydrogen potassium ATPs, resulting in more hydrogen ion secretion. And therefore, hypokalemia in metabolic alkalosis results in loss of more acid and makes your urine paradoxically acid. Hypokalemia maintains your alkalosis even if you have corrected the primary etiology. So make sure that you treat hypokalemia aggressively. In distal convoluted tubule, there is a protein called pentrin which helps secrete bicarb and this is a chloride bicarb exchanger. It gets activated in alkalosis. However, it requires chloride to excrete your bicarb. However, in volume depletion, hardly any chloride reaches DCT due to its massive reabsorption in the proximal tubules. So pendant doesn't work well. However, if you give these patients chloride, for example, as normal saline, you will stimulate this channel and this will improve your bicarbonate loss and improve your alkalosis. So what does your urine looks like in a hypovolemic state? As you remember, your sodium, chloride, and bicarb, they're all filtered out very well. And since most of the electrolyte are absorbed in proximal convoluted tubule, and in a hypovolemic state, this thing is ramped up. 
So you have increased sodium and chloride reabsorption here. So small amount of sodium and quite a bit of bicarb, this is your collecting duct. In collecting duct, under the influence of aldosterone, you have more sodium absorption and resultant potassium loss. Some of the bicarb reacts with your hydrogen ion to form carbon dioxide and aids in bicarb generation, but most of the bicarb is excreted in urine. Since very low amount of urine chloride reaches here, your urine chloride is also pretty low. So your urine is deficient in sodium and chloride, while it is high in potassium and bicarb. Your Fe urea is less than 35% and your urine pH will be more than 7. Compare these urine electrolytes with patients with primary hyperaldosteronism so that you can get better understanding. Metabolic alkalosis is compensated by respiratory means. So if you have metabolic alkalosis, your pH rises and you decrease your minute ventilation, resulting in CO2 retention and trying to normalize your metabolic alkalosis. So rise in 6 of bicarb usually results in increase of 10 of pCO2. However, the respiratory compensation in metabolic alkalosis is not very accurate, so interpret it with quite a bit of caution. And this happens because CO2 itself increases your renal acid secretion. And this effect is different in different patients. So this ratio cannot be used on all patients. So metabolic alkalosis results in hypoventilation mostly because of decrease in tidal volume rather than respiratory rate. And there are other formulas that have been thrown around. Your expected pCO2 equals 0.73 times bicarb level plus 20. In another study, your elevation in pCO2 was 1.2 millimeters of mercury for every one rise in bicarb. So in summary, the five physiological processes that will help you understand metabolic alkalosis are as follows. First, volume depletion stimulates aldosterone. Aldosterone causes volume expansion, hypokalemia and metabolic alkalosis. Alkalosis is maintained by hypokalemia as it causes intracellular acidosis which results in more hydrogen ion excretion and ammonia genesis along with bicarb generation. Increased sodium absorption in DCT and CD results in more negative intraluminal charge, therefore more efficient hydrogen and potassium loss. In DCT, pendrin helps secrete bicarb, but its activity depends upon availability of chloride. So most important one-liner if you want to take away from this is hypokalemia perpetuates alkalosis, so make sure that you correct it. When you encounter metabolic alkalosis, always evaluate their volume status. Hypokalemia is common to both the conditions. In hypervolumic state, this is primarily driven by primary increase in aldosterone, which is seen in primary hyperaldosteronism, hydrosteroids, or excessive ACTH, either from pituitary adenoma or ectopic production. Hypovolumic state stimulate your aldosterone production, so the aldosterone production is secondary, and this would be seen in patient with diuretic use, vomiting, laxative use, etc. Patients with primary increase in aldosteronism will have higher blood pressure as compared to those in which aldosterone production is secondary. Patients with hypovolemic state will also have low urine chloride, while your hypervolemic states will have high urine chloride. The exceptions include diuretic use and Barter and Gettleman syndrome, in which your sodium potassium chloride and your sodium chloride channels are affected. This would result in increased chloride loss. We'll discuss some of these physiology in the next lecture. Since now you know the basic tenets of metabolic alkalosis, you should be able to figure out how to work this up and how to manage them more effectively. Thank you.